It is Renee and Melissa today. I'm super excited to be introducing you to Melissa Hozak. She is the owner of Red Cliff PharmaSave in Canada. And uh, we're gonna be talking today about blood pressure and diabetes. So these are like some super important subjects. And um, certainly as coaches, we need to be aware of all of these uh, different indications that our clients are going to be asking us about, questions that they're going to present to us. But also as you, the dieter and client, you need to be aware of the things to ask your coach and your doctor. And when you're feeling certain things or how to uh, get, you know, reduce your medications, how to work closely with your coach and your doctor. So Melissa is going to be talking uh, about and, and answering quite a few questions in that area. But before we get started, I want to ask everybody to do a couple of things. First, would you please like our post? and love it if you do. And then of course, send us your questions. And most of all, share this post right away so that other people can come online during the broadcast. So all the sharing, liking, questions, those are awesome. Also, um, would you please, as we start getting going and as people start coming online, would you please share where you are from? Because then we know everybody and we start to get to know each other and uh, looking forward to working and talking with you today okay so um melissa i'm going to let you tell your story talk about what how you got involved with ideal protein your experience and your own personal experience and then we'll head over to our subject sounds good hello everybody uh, so I'm Melissa Hozak. I am the owner and pharmacist at Redcliffe Pharmacy here in Redcliffe, Alberta, in Canada. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I hit on some of our Canadian guidelines, some of our American things and stuff as we go for today. Uh, but my own history along with the program, um, I am a pharmacist by trade and my husband and I, well he's a pharmacist as well. We actually have owned our pharmacy now um, just over 10 years I believe it is. And we've been actually been doing Ideal Protein for the last four and a half, just about five years. And how it came about for me is that I actually, well, we have three kids together. And during my pregnancies, I gained and gained and gained. And I've always been a little bit uh, bigger girl, I guess you would say. And I was, you know, topping my weight, I think about 265 at one point. Um, and I was that mom who had her 10 pound baby and only lost five pounds. So I actually gained weight um, having my baby in the hospital, which is ridiculous. Um, so as I was coming back from my maternity leave, um, I was looking for something to really make a difference because um, by that point I'd kind of been a little bit tired of pharmacy in that we were just, you know, giving out medications and I wanted to really make a difference. So that's when I heard about Ideal Protein and from the time I heard about it to when I had it up and running in my store was 10 days. And I think that might be a record for them because I heard about it, we met with our BDC at the time and I was sold. It just made sense to me. So. Uh, that's what I really like about it as a pharmacist is that the numbers make sense and uh, the whole process basically makes sense in, in how we reset our metabolism. So I started the program as the first you know, client, coach, owner, everything, and I proceeded to lose 125 pounds. So I have kept that off now uh, for over four years because it took me about seven months or so to actually lose the weight. Um, I no longer have medications for asthma, arthritis. Uh, I used to have really, really sore knees and hips and joints and things. Don't have that anymore. Um, my allergies are pretty much gone. I don't use puffers anymore. Um, I have them around just in case, but I actually don't need, even need to use them now that the inflammation is gone and I've learned how to eat right. So uh, within our center now, I think we've helped about 850 clients or so lose just about 33,000 pounds. So it's been really rewarding as a pharmacist to be able to see people go through this process um, and really change their lives and see that transformation happen. So that's kind of a bit of my background with it. Um, and because we're in Alberta, the scope of practice for pharmacists is wonderful. And that's where it really fits well uh, for me and my practice anyway, that we get to look at, um, we get to look at blood pressure. I can look at medications online. Um, we can look at all of their blood work online. I send them for it. I actually have my prescribing now, so I can actually de-prescribe medications as people are going through the process. And that's why I got it, because I don't actually dispense in the pharmacy. 
And that's a really different thing for most pharmacists is that when they bring in the pro the program, they kind of set it aside for somebody else. But this is my baby. This is my hands on project kind of thing. Um, and that's yeah. what I do full time now. Yeah. I love it. I love that. Uh -huh. that, that, that yeah. Story. And uh, Brittany says, I want to see a before and after I had no clue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'll get one posted. I have some really big ones. I don't have many from, you know, after I had the baby and stuff, everything was focused on the baby and I really didn't like pictures of myself. Um, yeah. But I've got a couple. So I'll post them again because a lot of people are like, oh, I had no idea you lost that much weight. But yeah, I went through the process. And my first 100 pounds is about six months or so. So yeah, that's it was great. amazing. I, I mean, so, is that, hmm. I, I don't find that as being average for a female in my clinic. Um, so it, it's it typically my ladies lose around two, two and a half pounds a month. Um, but that is amazing. And, and it just shows oh, yeah. you how effective re reduction of the blood sugar levels, what, what a difference it makes in our bodies. Um, Everything. Okay, so I want to remind everybody, tell us where you're from, share the broadcast, and if you would like a copy of our brand new holiday tips and um, recipes guide, all you have to do in the comments section is type in ebook, and uh, so that's E-B-O-O-K, and uh, you should receive that through your Facebook Messenger. So um, let's get started, Melissa. Um, sure. Our first our first uh, subject or question is regarding blood pressure. Um, what do okay. you need to know about medications and the IP salt? Okay, so the first thing I want to touch on, if people are on um, blood pressure medications, we need to know which kinds of them. Uh, the biggest ones that I look for are the ones called the ACE inhibitors, um, which are the ones that end in something called Pril. So you might see lisinopril, captopril, things like that. And the other ones are the ones that we call the ARBs, and they might um, end in things like sartin, like low sartin, um, that sort of thing. And the reason for that is because uh, they're actually called potassium sparing medications. So in the way they work, we don't want to give a bunch of extra potassium, um, as in our ideal protein salt. We actually want to give them just that Redmond salt. And that's the biggest mistake I've seen um, in a lot of questions I get from people or from some transfers we might have seen here and there in that if they're on something like lisinopril, they can be on our potassium supplement, but not the ideoprotein salt. So at one point, um, we're gonna look at when we're gonna do changes in that, but uh, they may have to go on that ideal salt after they come off of those medications, but that's gonna be the biggest thing that we're gonna see. Okay, um, so, okay, so do you automatically start your, your patients on the ideal protein salt? Um, I start everybody on them unless they're on um, those ACEs or ARBs um, or if there's some other reason that they have high potassium or something in their blood work that I've seen, um, different things like that. Hi, okay. Dee, I see you there now too. <laughs> um, so, and Dee is my coach as well. So when just going from a non-pharmacist. That come to us and they are uh, on blood pressure meds, should we automatically just give them the real salt instead of the ideal protein salt that has the additional potassium in it? Um, I think you should, uh, there is a document, I believe in the clinic manual that shows you which drugs um, need that Redmond salt versus the ideal protein salt. Um, so just make sure you have that list available. Uh, maybe okay. we could post it or something at one point, but it actually shows you those ACE inhibitors, those ARBs, um, and then when you actually take out the potassium supplement as well, when you're on a certain diuretic like spironolactone or something. Um, so those are always really important ones to start with, but there's an actual ideal protein salt document that everybody should be familiar with. Okay, sure. great. Okay, okay. That's great information. Um, all right. So uh, the next th uh, question that we have is, um, when do you need to see your pharmacist or physician about medication changes um, for right. the blood pressure? So generally, we can actually start to see some pretty dramatic drops within the first week or two, because depending on how much glycogen and water weight they lose, that can be a big pressure right off the bat. Um, and as soon as you start, start taking the sugar out of the diet and that starts to reduce the amount of insulin that's produced, the insulin is what tells our kidneys to retain salt and water. So without that there, all of a sudden you start to see that big drop start to happen. So generally, I wouldn't adjust medications um, until at least a week or two in. 
Um, and for anybody who's not sure on that, we actually ask people to do their self-testing or they can do it in the pharmacy when they're there because you can always stick your arm in the cuff and do it right there. Um, but generally, I'll start de-prescribing and looking at doing that or making a recommendation to the physician um, on that part. Somewhere, if their blood pressure is getting down below that, like 110, 100 or so over 60 or 70. So if you're getting in that range and starting to notice the symptoms of hypotension, so where you're feeling like a little bit lightheaded or dizzy, just feeling kind of off, sometimes even nauseous, that sort of thing, that's where we'd start to look at decreasing those meds. Uh, the first one I always like to take out um, as per Dr. Rothrock's recommendation is actually a water pill called their hydrochlorothiazide because that can actually affect insulin resistance. So we want to try to get that out of the, the system. Um, but it's also a good water pill so that it, when they're getting rid of lots of fluids in the first couple weeks, that would be the first one I take out usually about week three or four kind of thing. Um, and then from there, we'd look at doing it um, separately. So if you're on an ACE inhibitor that's 10 milligrams, we might go to five, maybe to 2.5 and then off from there. So something, you know, slowly, so it's not going to be a big drop right away. Um, and then to remind your dieters too, when you're going to take that blood pressure med out right off the bat, um, and of course, if you're in a clinic that doesn't have a pharmacist or a physician, you're doing that along with the doctors. You're not just telling them to stop it. You want them to make sure they get that medical advice as well. Um, but when they do take that blood pressure pill away, that they're going to, you know, initially see a little bit of a rise in that blood pressure, but it'll still be okay because it'll start to balance off as the body gets used to it. So that's okay. usually where I start to kind of look at is um, when they're self-testing and noticing the feelings of low blood pressure, along with seeing those numbers that happen along with it. Okay. So that's what I would see anyway. All right. So um, for diabetes, why do some people start on the ideal protein alternative? Hello. I'm breaking out again. Okay. Um, any better? Sometimes it's it's it can be the um, the streaming. We had this problem last time with uh, Rosemary when she was in the hotel. Oh. So, um, are you there? Are you there, Melissa? We can hear you. Uh, you look like you're frozen, and I don't hear anything again. Are you there? So um, sorry, guys. Just bear with us here. If you can hear me, yeah, um, we can hear you. We can keep talking. Um, I think it's your. Um, oh, there I hear you. <laughs> it can be your uh, broadband if it's you know if it's not not fast enough. Can you hear us? So um, just a little a little technical difficulty. So um, hopefully. Melissa can, Melissa's going to probably log back out and log back in again. But in the meantime, um, these broadcasts are great because they are going to be, um, they will be also uploaded to our YouTube channel. And so you will be able to share them um, with your clients and you can and you can see them on on YouTube and and share them that way. So hopefully we'll get Melissa back here in a second. Can you guys hear me talking? Give me a thumbs up. And in the meantime, um, let's go ahead and and just share where everybody is from. Hopefully we can jump back online here with Melissa.
Thanks, Jackie. I'm glad you can hear us in Calgary. <laughs> We're trying to get uh, Melissa back online here. Hopefully that's going to happen pretty quickly. Um, in the meantime, do you guys have any questions for Melissa um, about this subject? Please. There you are. The broadcast. <laughs> there she is. We made it. So we were just okay. talking about uh, questions. So um, that that la that last question was uh, for diabetes. Why do some people start on the alternative program? How do you know when right. someone would start on the uh, alternative program? Okay, for some people who. You know, you're going through the health profile, we're told that we should actually circle all of their um, carbohydrate intakes. So if they're having a muffin at breakfast, fruit in the morning, you know, a sandwich at lunchtime, that sort of thing, you're circling all those things off. You can see they have a really high carbohydrate, carbohydrate intake. That might be somebody, you know, if they don't have blood glucose control and, and that sort of thing, that we actually want to start them on alternative because it's a good kind of baby step to get them, you know, adjusted a little bit slowly and not have as steep a cravings right off the bat and that sort of thing. Because it really is an addiction that we have to try to get away from. So I think using that alternative plan for a week or two um, is a great step in that. And for anybody who's not sure about even having someone start the program, that's where I would even start them in phase four. And I call it my you know, clean phase four. I think Rose calls it like a 3.97 or something like that, I've heard her say. Um, but actually starting them on a very low carb phase four and then going into alternative for a couple of weeks and then getting them into phase one. So it's kind of a nice baby step to get them down there. So is this someone that may start out by having reactions, um, terrible headaches, the flu symptoms, rashes, different things like mm -hmm. that. If that happens, do you just switch them to the alternative program for a couple of weeks, detox their system, and then bring them back? Do you bring them directly back to phase one from alternative? For me, if I've already got them to phase one and they're getting to that point, that's a good sign they're getting to ketosis. So if you've already started them with phase one and they're having that reaction, then just let them go with it. Um, but if you suspect that there's going to be a whole lot of issues like that, or they, you know, right off the bat, they said they've tried something before and they normally get headaches, maybe it's a better idea to start with alternative for a week or two and then step down from there. But if they're already going with phase one, they're already through the, the worst of it like that and, and should be okay like that. Okay, um, so we have a question um, from Jackie. Jackie asks, what is the ideal range for blood sugar levels? Um, so I had to look this up for U.S. because it's different units on there. But in the USA, they talk about a non-diabetic using um, testing at 70 to 100 as their fasting levels. Um, and then for diabetics, they go 70 to 130. And then after meals, they want it still less than 180 for diabetics. And that's what the guidelines say. I'd like to see that getting down to that 70 to 100 range anyway. Um, in Canada here, our numbers are quite a bit different. So our numbers are four to seven. Um, they used to be five to eight feeling great. Now they're four to seven, and that's what we would try to aim for. And after a meal, if they're testing, it's about 3.9 to 7.2. Um, and it's just a matter of different units that we're looking at in there. But if I were to say we want our numbers to be at 7.2 and someone in the States told me they're at 130, they'd be you know, really far off. So we need to make sure we know which units we're looking at. So... That's 70 to 100 in the USA and 4 to 7 roughly in Canada, I think is what, our, what we want to look at for, for good numbers. Um, okay. And if we have a new okay. diabetic starting the program, I would have them self-testing at least three to four times a day as well, um, especially if they're on insulin. That's going to be a whole other story, but we want them testing fairly regularly because those numbers, as we know, are going to drop dramatically when they're not eating that sugar then. Ah, okay, so, great. Okay. All right, so um, our next question is, how soon should you adjust medications with your doctor or pharmacist? Right, so with those ones, uh, there's a couple of different ones we need to look at. So there's the brand new ones, the SGLT2, um, the, the new sodium glucose co-transporters. These ones, they actually um, get the sugar coming out in the urine. So those are ones that actually have in their indications even, make sure you're not taking these on a ketogenic diet. So for those people, if they're on those, definitely start them in phase four, start watching what the sugars do um, and get them to alternative. And by the time they get to that point, they're probably not gonna need it anyway. So that's when we would take that one out before they even start phase one. So that's one thing we have to get rid of right away because they actually, I think there's about 100 grams of glucose is what they um, get out of the body um, just in the urine every day. 
and we're only consuming 40 grams of carbs in the whole day in phase one. So we need to really make sure that they're getting off of those ones fairly quickly. Uh, some of the newer ones, the GLP ones, there's one like Victoza, these are injections and things that they've got. They actually have some indication that they help with weight loss. So you can get them off fairly soon with those ones because they, they don't really need them, but they're glucagon like peptides. And if we remember that we're trying to reset that insulin and glucagon balance in there, it's actually better to have more of that glucagon-like response too. So that one you can leave a little bit longer, but chances are you won't need it. Uh, there's other ones, those, those ones that start with Gs. There's, they're called sulfonylureas, things like glycoside and gliburide. Um, those ones we actually decrease in half on day one of phase one um, because they tell the pancreas to produce more insulin. And we want to get rid of the insulin in the system. That's what we're really trying to reset is insulin resistance. So usually in half by day one and by week, you know, one, two, three, something like that, even they're going to be gone altogether too. So that's a really quick one. Uh, the metformin you're going to see a lot of people on. It doesn't have as much of a risk for hypoglycemia like the other ones do. Um, and that's meaning you don't go low blood sugars like the other ones. Uh, but with those, it can actually start to interfere with gluconeogenesis and how it works. So if we're thinking about the liver making that little tiny bit of glucose that we need um, for the brain, the red blood cells, and their adrenal glands to, to function, eventually we're going to want to get rid of the metformin as well. But that would be the last one we probably switch out then. So you, so. So it's okay for them to be in phase one and be taking metformin. Right. Yeah, exactly. And the okay. other ones, generally, we start to get rid of fairly quickly. So, so definitely okay. be talking with the doctor, physician, pharmacist, anything like that. Um, right. And if they're ever not okay. sure, I'll always send it into scientific support. So if this is coaches and clinics watching, you're not sure, get it into scientific support. Um, use the resources like we have on our page uh, with some of us that are answering questions and stuff like that as well. Yeah, it can really help. Okay. Coaches Forum is, is such a great place. So um, mm -hmm. if we have uh, dieters online, something very important is that you work very closely with your physician. If your coach is not in a medical clinic, be very um, concerned what, you know, first of all, make sure that your doctor understands what kind of a program that you are going to go on and definitely get their sign off on coming on to mm -hmm. Ideal Protein. And then have your doctor work very closely with your coach to mm -hmm. make sure that you're feeling good, all of your medications are at the right place. And uh, don't wait three months to go see someone and, and no. tell them, that you decided to lose 30 or 40 pounds. Right, Melissa? That's right, yes. Um, I usually get blood work done as a baseline level if I know there's anything going on and if they haven't had it recently. And then usually every 25 to 30 pounds, I'd like to see blood work again. So that's usually in you know six weeks or so for some people. So it can go fairly, fairly quick. So you need to be kind of aware of when to be adjusting those things like that, for okay. sure. So I see a few more people have come online. So please be sure to like and share. And again, um, let us know where you are from and so that we can uh, highlight you and say hello to you. Uh, we have another question here. Um, what about insulin for type 2 diabetics? So how do we Okay, so type just to look at what the difference of type 1 and type 2 is, traditionally type 1 diabetes is diagnosed early on and they actually are not producing insulin that they need. Generally later in life when people have been a type 2 diabetic for quite a while um, and maybe their medications aren't working because that insulin resistance is so bad, that's when they get put on insulin. Now there's some old thinking still that if you get put on insulin you're a type 1. This is not true. You're still a type 2 diabetic and you don't necessarily need to be on it the rest of your life. So that's the good news. Um, but it, everybody who's on insulin as a type 2 diabetic will have a sliding scale of what their dosage is um, going to be according to what their blood sugar is. So these are the ones that you really are going to have to work on because um, right off the bat, most of their insulin doses end up being decreased by half right off the bat uh, because it's going to be such a lower amount of carbohydrate in the diet. And you can always check that, um, you know, going by their health profile, seeing what their normal intake is, that sort of thing. And they're going to basically have to decrease that dose in half by day one and be probably decreasing it over the week till, you know, by the next week or two, they might be off of it altogether. But they have to stick with the program or that blood sugar is going to come back up again. And they're going to need a good, you know, self-testing program. So they need those AccuChecks done um, at least three or four times a day. 
And generally, if I have somebody that I'm uh, monitoring with insulin therapy like that, I'm going to be checking in with them at least once or twice a day as a coach as well. So I'll be texting them or, you know, calling back and forth, making sure they're checking in um, along with their weekly check-ins, because it is a lot of work to have to adjust those ones. And we want to make sure they're doing it safely and correctly that way, too. That's right. I, you know, in my own uh, clinic where I am definitely not a medical practitioner, I have had so many clients come off of blood pressure meds. They're no longer on their type 2 diabetes meds. It, it's such a, a pleasure to um, see this and they're so excited when they get their numbers and the thing to that you know I want to express to all of you out there that maybe you're watching you haven't tried the program yet you're concerned about these issues you're you know once when we get sick we we feel scared so um you know really meet with an ideal protein coach Find out what all of your options are because I can tell you and Melissa can tell you uh, much more so than myself how easy it is and how simple. And it's really a matter of, like you said, 20 to 30 pounds and boom, life mm -hmm. changes. Definitely. Yeah, people are always surprised, you know, when they start to hear that they don't have to be on these medications for the rest of their life because traditional thinking and how I was taught in pharmacy school was that you're going to be a diabetic the rest of your life. Um, and for the most part, we can start to control that with diet. So like Hippocrates says in 400 BC, we're going to let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, I love, I love that. Yeah, and it definitely has to be a lifestyle change. It's not just a diet. You know, we're, yes, we're getting you to lose the weight. That's almost a byproduct of fixing everything else that we're going along with it. Um, but you start to feel so much better. Um, and as you start to eat and what, you know, you can put back in in maintenance, everybody's a little bit different and they have a different carb tolerance in there. For me, I think because I had got so big, um, like I said, through my pregnancies and I use that as my... I crutch, right? It was basically the blizzards and the junk food I was eating that made me gain that weight, right? Um, yes, but I did the it, same thing. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's be real. It wasn't just the pregnancy, although I say I got pregnant and I gained all this weight through it. Um, but I think because I'm very carb sensitive or insulin resistant, whatever the term you want to call it is, I have to keep my carbs really low or the weight does start to come back. Um, and I've had to do a couple of resets here and there. I'll be honest. I just have done one over the summer. Um, and I had to lose 25 pounds again, and now I'm feeling good, staying at my weight, um, and I know I just can't put some different things back in. So, so for me, a, sorry, that's a really good term. You know, I, I had a client come in just this last week and say, so what's this thing like? Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He uh, started out, they, they said, look, you're diabetic, you're going to be diabetic forever, just like you mm -hmm. said. And I told him, you know, come on, let's do this. So he lost 30 pounds, went into his doctor. He was psyched. He got off all his meds. And then he, you know, started having a really great time. And over the summer, he gained 10 pounds back. Now he's not feeling good. He's upset about it. He doesn't understand why it, it, it came back on. Well, of course, because he went back to all of your bad habits. Um, exactly. But anyway, we, you know, he said, so like, what's this thing? Like the doctor told me, like, I have insulin resistance. So can you explain mm. in layman's terms mm -hmm. what's Absolutely. insulin resistance? So insulin resistance, um, basically when you're eating those carbohydrates, you know, six, seven, eight times a day before we really know what's going on, when we're making those yellow highlighter circles on your health profile, um, you, every time your body sees sugar, it has to produce a dose of insulin in response to it. Your insulin is there to get your blood sugar down. That's what people know. But what they're not realizing is that it has to put it somewhere. So insulin is our fat storing hormone and that it actually opens up the fat cells and tucks away all that sugar that's going into the system. After a while, your body starts to say, hey, I've had enough, no more. So that is where the insulin resistance starts to happen. Um, if I look in the pharmacy for what medications we've got in there, almost every one of them turns off a switch that insulin turns on. So the biggest indicator of this one that I found that I, I didn't know before uh, was with your cholesterol. And I know we're not really talking about that one for today, but in the same sense with insulin resistance, insulin turns on a switch in the liver that all your statin drugs actually turn off. 
So if you're on drugs like Lipitor and Zocor and all these statin drugs and you want to get off of those, you have to stop eating sugar so that you stop producing insulin so that your liver will stop producing that extra LDL cholesterol. And then you can get off the, I've had people off statins within about six weeks and that's only as early as I've checked because we did sick, you know, they lost 30 pounds, had did their blood work, get them off those things. So that insulin resistance that we talk about is basically just your body saying, I've had enough. We don't want any more. And if you keep feeding it to me, you're going to end up with the metabolic syndrome components. That's your high blood pressure, your cholesterol, diabetes, and obesity. Um, on top of that, when we look at that one as the big X, you hear it called X, um, what's it called? Like syndrome X. Um, yes. The ones yes. that go with that are is like a plus. So if you think about your X, you've got your plus in between. Um, and the plus is gout, chronic inflammation, PCOS, and hypothyroidism. So those are all ones that are connected to insulin resistance. So if you have, um, we've had quite a few females that come in, maybe they have PCOS, hypothyroidism, um, and what we call skinny fat, they actually have a low amount of lean mass, um, but a high proportion of fat in the body like that. It's actually the same thing as metabolic syndrome of somebody who is obese and has diabetes and cholesterol. And eventually all those things start to fall in place the same way. So that's where we need to reset everything in that that's what the insulin resistance is causing. Does that kind of make sense? <laughs> I love that term skinny fat because it's it's always interesting to me. We we have a, a in-body 520 machine and, you know, it will tell us um, you need to reduce uh, body fat by so much. And, and it can be a small amount. And then it'll say, but you need to gain this much muscle. And, you know, our client thinks that, oh, well, I'm not that fat. But mm -hmm. then, you know, it's that balance of having the lean mass. And, you know, uh, just because you don't have a huge percentage rate of body fat doesn't mean you don't need to do something about the sugar intake. And you're yes. right. Those people tend to have thyroid sensitivity and, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the other things that you mentioned, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, we sure. have a, a comment here from Diane and she says, mm -hmm. it's like you're speaking just to me. <laughs> My leptin is through mm -hmm. the roof. Can you touch a little bit on uh, leptin, leptin resistance, how that all works? From my understanding with that, leptin is the, the hormone in the body that actually makes you feel full. So a lot of people feel like they don't want to eat anymore if they have a lot of leptin like that. Um, in general, if you're going to be, you know, I don't, I don't think I've ever actually seen it on a blood test or anything. So that's kind of interesting that they actually have it on there to be able to look at it. Um, if you're in ketosis, though, I would think that you're not actually going to be feeling that hunger anymore, probably because of those leptin levels in there as well, because we're not having the ups and downs with your blood sugar levels or anything like that. You're not having those highs and lows of insulin during the day. It's, it's just pretty you know, steady that way. Um, and the cells themselves are not hungry at that point because they're getting enough um, energy from the ketones that are breaking down from the fat. So that's right. what I'm thinking. Okay. If you are doing a true phase one and resetting your system like that. Um, and I've had people that are actually my very lowest um, dieter, I think was only about 115 pounds when she started. Um, and, but it had all those, you know, metabolic syndrome components with it. And she actually gained weight the first week and, but lost inches. And we knew she was starting to feel better right off the bat like that too. So that's where that skinny fat comes into play there too. Right. Yeah. So. That was <laughs> A uh, story that I, I mentioned online. Can you outline how how you know you work with someone that actually gains weight the first week? <laughs> Absolutely. So we have um, one of the higher end Tanita machines. I think it was about thirty five hundred dollars or something. So it's a really good one that measures all those things. Um, so for her, she was actually wanting to just come in and lose seven pounds because her pants weren't fitting. But lo and behold, she didn't realize that we were going to start to fix some of her cholesterol, blood pressure, thyroid issues, all these other things with it. So when we saw what her, um, or her lean mass, I think was about 90 pounds and, uh, her weight was about 115, something like that. And when she came back in, she had actually gained and went to that 117, 118. I can't remember exactly, but her lean mass had jumped about three or four pounds. And she was feeling fabulous, had still lost the inches with it. And her body went, hey, I have protein. I can use this. You know, and she'd probably been so protein deprived for such a long time or protein deficient is what we usually say. 
um, that her body decided, hey, I can make muscle cells. I can, you know, use this for my white blood cells and boost my immunity or, or whatever it is. Because we use protein in every single cell. And your body gets really efficient in knowing where to pull that from um, if it's not getting it in your diet. So we often... Uh, we often will see that with some vegan or vegetarians if they're not doing the, their their diets quite right, if they're not getting enough protein in there. Um, and I'm not to say, you know, you don't have to be vegetarian or not or whatever, um, but you have to look at where you're getting your protein from and getting enough of it that it's not only protein with carbs. I think that's the biggest thing is that they start, you know, missing out on some of those protein sources for, you know, because they're not eating just pure eggs and meat and that kind of thing, right? So, yes, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. a large uh, amount of vegetarians and just culturally, mm -hmm. um, it, it can be, we, we have to take a period of time, it may be somewhere between two and four weeks to get the right level of protein to keep the body from losing lean mass. And, and it just really is, sometimes it's, it's being mm -hmm. patient, taking the time, Definitely you know, allow your coach to work with you and find the right balance and the right kind of proteins that are going to work for you as a vegetarian. Definitely. I find a lot of our vegetarian clients really like the ideal protein foods and they will continue them, you know, for the rest of their lives, whether it's a vanilla drink with a tea or something or whatever it might be. They have some favorite things that they can use and a lot of them work just fine within what they want to be consuming and that kind of thing. So yes. it's great protein that way because it's well assimilated. It's already broken down in the isolate form. I mean, it's perfect for them to be able to keep going with that and get some extra protein without the extra carbs in there. So Absolutely. I think it's great for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have a client that traveled last year to India for about three months and I, I'm pretty sure she took either one or two suitcases Oh, wow. full of her ideal protein favorites and then her husband came over like a month after she left and he took a suitcase too um so she's traveling so much and it's so difficult there to get the right you know proteins or or any yes. protein um Absolutely. so yeah yeah i think i had read somewhere um that india was now leading the way in type 2 diabetes and i don't know if that's because it's such a such a high carb consumption that way uh, when you're looking at different you know rices and breads and things like that without getting as much protein that that's one thing that I think a lot of culturally we're going to have to start to look at that to be able to get those protein sources in for people definitely, definitely. Okay. Uh, we have another uh, question here uh, from Diane the gal that was talking about her leptin levels and she said my coach said my protein was low this week I have been eating my eight ounces a day. Should I eat more? If so, how much? Um, so I'm not sure about how they would know your protein is low. Um, if you're getting your three packets a day and your eight ounces a day, that should be plenty. Um, unless you have a lean mass of 200 pounds or more. Um, I'm just looking at a tiny little thumbnail picture. I wouldn't think that you have 200 pounds of lean mass because I've seen a couple of guys like that and they're like big, strong army police officer, those type of guys. Um, so if you're getting your three ounces or your, sorry, your three packets and your eight ounces a day, that should be enough for you. Um, if you're losing lean mass, I would look at adding your branch chain amino acids. Make sure you're not working out. Um, make sure you're getting um, all of your three packets, like we said and that you're losing as much fat as you should because you shouldn't be dipping into your muscle stores or anything. So um, I'm not sure what they mean by your protein was low, but if you're getting your eight ounces, that should be uh, you know, sufficient for what I would look at. Uh, you know, other things that I tell my clients are make sure you are eating every three to three and a half hours because your protein metabolizes over that period of time. Once that's gone, your body doesn't have any glucose to run on. So you need to make sure that every three hours you're putting in a good source of protein so that your body has something to burn so that it uses its own fat for energy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's definitely important also. So we have another uh, comment here. Richard uh, said, I have lost 80 pounds since June 5th and have stopped all diabetes medication two months ago. And that is just awesome. spectacular. Mm -hmm. you, you know, definitely Absolutely. this can be done. It happens on a consistent basis. This isn't just random, oh, this one person out of 10 gets off their meds. 
you know, if you do things and you change your body chemistry, you can reverse these things and mm -hmm. ultimately get yourself back to the kind of health you had 10, 15, 20 years ago, who know, you know, absolutely. And I think um, Richard first, that's awesome. Definitely keep it up. Um, I don't know where you're at in your journey. If you're going to be done after this 80 pounds, or you still have a little more, but that is awesome. Um, and I think the biggest thing you're going to have to learn about when you get to maintenance then is keeping your carbs low. And for me, I think of it as um, my GPS. I heard about this on a TED Talks. Um, it was Dr. Sarah Helberg that I had watched. Um, she talks about GPS and knowing where you're going with that. And your GPS stands for your grains, potatoes, and sugars. So it's oh. not <laughs> junk food. Yeah, GPS. That's the easiest thing to think of it. Like, where are you going with this? Are you eating grains? Are you eating um, sugars? Are you eating junk food? Are you eating starches, potatoes, anything like that? Because they all show up in the body as sugar, depending, you know, it might take a little longer for some if they're long chains or whatever, but your body produces one insulin in response to it. And that's where the problem is. So 50 more pounds to go. So stay the course, get through Halloween, get through Thanksgiving, get through Christmas, and you're going to be set. You're going to make yeah, new lifestyle yeah. choices. And hopefully everyone around you is starting to catch on that this is the way that we should be eating with that too. That's Definitely right. Available. So, <laughs> Melissa, before we head out here, actually, if I can, you know, I see more people coming onto the broadcast. If you could like mm -hmm. and share the broadcast, we're going to be closing up here pretty soon. And the broadcast will be downloaded and then uploaded again to our YouTube channel. And I will put that um, link in the broadcast. Um, but since we're, we're here and the holidays are upon us in like 23 days, we're going to be, uh, having, uh, well, maybe you won't be having Thanksgiving dinner, but we'll be having <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner. Why don't you tell us what you had for Thanksgiving dinner? Mm. So I do well, because we're Canada, we had Thanksgiving a couple weeks ago. Um, okay. but I do a completely low carb Thanksgiving dinner now. So I take our. Uh, potato puree and make them into biscuits so I did I think I did four packages of them for our family this year made them into the biscuits with the egg whites fluff them up bake them and everything and then I actually slice them in half and then toast them so they're nice and crispy just like a regular bread crouton kind of thing would be chop it up and I made that into my stuffing uh, we also had well coach D is on here right now and she's the one that creates a lot of these recipes that um, she went to Quebec and filmed with Chef Verratti so they're going to be on your app first of all I'll put a little plug in for her uh, they're going to be on your app hopefully in the new year um, under some cooking baking videos so along with that we did uh, I still had some raspberry mousse around so I did some raspberry mousse parfaits with the jello and then I take that chocolate raspberry temptation bar and shave it and make nice little chocolate shavings on top too so those were great and then because I'm actually in maintenance like this, I would take um, my turnips, rutabagas, cauliflowers, mix them all together and make a mashed potato, I guess you call it, along with some whipping cream mixed in and some butter. And then we take our broccoli and cauliflower, steam them. I melt cheese right over top of them um, because we really focus on getting those healthy fats in. Uh, so right. we eat a lot of right. cheese and bacon and whipping cream and butter. And all those delicious, rich foods that people say, oh, that's so rich. And I say, yes, absolutely. And I eat it every day. <laughs> it's just that you can't have it with those grains of potatoes and the sugars. That's the biggest thing, right? Okay, so, so that's, that's, what that's, what that's, like. that's really and turkey, good of course. Point. That's mm -hmm. a really good point. So remember that all of these things that Melissa's broadcast, but in future broadcasts, um, everybody has different opinions. Everything works differently for every single person. So maybe if you're, you know, lactose intolerant, you're not going to be having whipping cream or, you know, uh, different, different ways to have healthy fats. We will definitely discuss that for the future. I did want to, um, just kind of backtrack, uh, for a minute. Uh, D put, uh, a comment on here. She said, if you eat over your three packets a day, making sure one is restricted, and your eight ounces, you are essentially just feeding your fat. And on the other spectrum, work really hard not to short yourself on eight ounces and three packets. Your body depends on them. So do you want to touch on that just a minute? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dee and I had actually just attended Super Weekend in Vancouver a couple of weeks ago, and that's one thing that they really spoke about was that 
Uh, if you're having more than the three packets, but you don't have that 200 pounds lean mass, you're really just feeding that fat and you're feeding the cravings and you're feeding all these things that you don't really need in there. So we always, they were even telling us that, you know, when you think about it, if you're hungry, are you actually hungry or is it just a craving? Uh, would you go to the fridge and eat a tomato was the example they use. For me, absolutely not because I don't like raw tomatoes. But if you're going to go there and think, am I hungry for like a whole stock of celery or something? Probably not. You're probably, you know, craving something that, you know, you would have had in your old bad habit days. So that's where we kind of look at it and using, um, are you feeding the fat or are you feeding an actual hunger craving? So that's where we look at those. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dee also made a comment saying, um, oh, Susan said, oh, that sounds really fattening. And then she said, oh, I'm just starting. Yes, Susan, you will get there. You'll get to your maintenance phase. And, and what we're talking about is um, the ability to, you know, when we change our lifestyle, we're not going to go back to the way we ate before, which chances are was very high in carbs and sugars. But we're going to transition into more of a low carb, high fat or higher, maybe not high fat, but higher fat scenario. Um, we we sure. were told at one point that being low fat was, you know, the most important thing. And now we have found out that taking away all of those fats did not help us and eating all these low fat items ended up causing us to gain weight and get diabetes and, and a host of other things. Um, so one thing that Dee has said here is um, we have IP friendly stuffing, gravings, faux mashed potatoes made with turnips, rutabagas, cauliflowers, bean casserole, roasted Brussels mm. sprouts, and many versions of ideal protein pie. And by the way, Dee, please uh, <laughs> put name of your uh, Facebook group on here so that people can join and all you have to do is click mm -hmm. on there and Dee will add you and she shares recipes all the time they're amazing they look like recipe cards she uh, really does do a great job with that and not only that then she makes them and takes them to mm -hmm. Melissa's pharmacy and everybody gets mm -hmm. to taste them I'm always like wow that looks amazing so that was fabulous uh, she Thank spoils you. us. <laughs> All right. Um, anything anybody else wants to talk about or anything you'd like to talk about, Melissa? Um, not too much else for right now, I guess. We've covered a lot of them. Um, I know, you know, since we started doing this and talking about these, I've had a lot of coaches say, you know, this is going to be great because they really want that, you know, one-on-one -on -one feedback and being able to hear people talk about it a little bit more. Um, I always tell people, you know, attend super weekends when you can, they are switching up formats here and there, and they've got separate provider sessions, which are great. Um, but hearing from us, um, and I always mention, I'm not part of corporate. I don't think you are as either Renee, we are independent audio protein clinic owners. Um, yeah. I'm a pharmacist first and my, you know, we run Red Cliff Pharmacy and everything else we're doing besides that really helps our clients grow. Um, and everything that I've learned along the way is usually from a lot of other clinic owners and coaches and seeing what they're doing with it, along with what I've learned from our scientific support. Um, so really use, use each other like this to be able to learn and, and grow, I guess. So the, the bottom line that I always like to, to tell people is as coaches, first of all, as, as ideal protein clinic owners, we own our own businesses. We run mm -hmm. them independently. And, uh, you know, we learn from each other, but in all honesty, Melissa runs her clinic, I'm sure completely different than I do. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the bottom line is find a coach that is passionate about losing weight and maintaining weight. And it's, you know, I Definitely. always tell my clients, this is not a diet mill. I'm interviewing you just as much as you're interviewing me today because I want to make sure that you're ready, you're on board, you're a hundred percent in, because that's the only way this is going to work. And you and I are going to get to know each other really, really well. We're going to be besties. <laughs> so um, you know, it, don't look at your coach and think, well, she doesn't understand me because guess what? I've been 200 pounds three times in my life. And it took mm -hmm. me a while of ups and downs. I didn't have a coach. I didn't have ideal protein. I I think it took me like 
14 years to lose my last 10 pounds up and down, up and down, up and down. <laughs> so, you know, it's such a privilege to have a product like this. And that's the reason I opened my clinic as I was so impressed by it. I've been having a protein shake every day of my life for the last, you know, 20 years or so. And um, why not do something that actually makes sense is healthy and provides my body with the right elements to stay balanced so that I don't have all of the different diseases and issues coming up for me. So th those are my inspiration. And if you weren't on uh, the broadcast earlier, Melissa has lost 126 pounds? 125 pounds. I've stopped counting. So whenever I reset, I don't add to that. Um, I joke that it's probably more like 200 or 250 total with the program because it's been, you know, a couple of resets here and there over the last couple of years. But I, like you said, I still have a shake in my coffee or something every day. Oh, I still, no. I just got, I just got, I should have brought them over here to show, but I just got the triple chocolate non-restricted wafers yesterday too. Oh. So oh, we have them in um, and we have the lemon ones on order too. So I have those to snack on now too. Are, are so, they in the U.S. now? I don't know if they're released there yet. I think we maybe get them first, but I'd heard they're coming. So All right. Well, so, yes, one last comment. Be before we go, one last comment. Um, Susan wanted to share that her um, friend Mo Davis, her coach, uh, told her about this Facebook Live. Thank you, Mo. And yes, um, I'm glad she got the info. She is ready to make that commitment. And yes, really, I've been 200 pounds three times. <laughs> <laughs> I was 265 at one point. And I, you know, right now I'm sitting around the 150 and feel pretty good there. So yeah, yeah. That's you cool. can do it. Stay All the right. course. We'll so get there. Remember, I'm going to put the link in the broadcast so that you can go to YouTube you can share this, you can like it. And again, if you're interested in our, holly, our holiday recipes ebook, all you have to do is type in ebook in the comments and your messenger will send you a copy of that. So looking forward to talking to you guys next week. Next week is Dr. Zimbato and she's gonna be talking about maintenance. And uh, so she has a great formula for maintenance and uh, has a, a really great program. And I'm looking forward to talking to her about that. So everybody have a great day. Melissa, awesome. it was fantastic Good. being online with you. And mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to talking to everybody next week. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Bye. Perspective, that's what I train my